I'm Sue Hausman, Director of Education for Viking Sewing Machine Company. And I'm Nina K. Donovan, Educational Consultant for Viking. And we're here today to help you learn more about your new Husky Lock. Actually, whether you have purchased the top-of-the-line Husky Lock Model 1001L, or maybe you have the 1000L model, or maybe the Model 1000, whichever you own, we'll be helping you to learn to sew faster, and we hope it'll be a lot easier, and also we're going to help you sew and have a much more professional finish. Well, I will share with you that there is a companion handbook available for your Husky Lock, and this can be purchased at your local Viking dealer. It's what we'll be sewing through step by step with the video today and gluing samples in for future reference. You may want to start with your VCR counter at zero so that you can refer back to it to a certain place on the tape for reference later when you've forgotten just exactly what we did. Well, Nina K, let's talk a little bit about setting up their Husky Locks. When you take them out of the box, of course, you need to plug them in, and uh, there is a cord for the plug for the foot control, and there's also a cord that goes to the wall. And the on-off switch is right over there on the right-hand side. So will you switch it on, Nina? Great. And I want to share that there is a light switch separate from on-off, because once in a while you might bump that and wonder why the light go off. So it's right under back here, okay, okay? and in essence that will turn the light on and off separate from on-off. Mm -hmm. One of the great things is that your new Husky Lock has a waste tray. Do you like that feature? Nancy? Yes, it's a great feature. <laughs> and it'll be right on the front. And inside the waste tray is the accessory box for storage. So slip that out and you can use that to get at your accessories and then your waste tray just hangs right on the front of your Husky Lock. Super! Well, I'd like to share that, of course, we have a number of different capabilities with our Husky Lock 90K. And we want to talk about one of the ones that we're really excited about on the model 1000L and 1001L, and that's the sewing advisor right there on the front. That display when that it shows you everything you need to do to sew. That's right. It's just step by step. There's no guesswork, no looking things up in the instruction book. Well, the first thing we would do would be to enter the technique we want to sew, and we'd touch button A for that, right? Yes. And so what are you bringing up? Uh, right now it's on five thread, but we want to go to four thread. So our first technique would be or four thread overlock sewing. And then the next step would be to tell our sewing advisor what kind of fabric we're sewing on. And I know that we have all different kinds of fabric available. Some are medium, you know, weight. That would be normal material that doesn't have stretch to it. And then there might be a normal stretch that would be kind of a medium weight fabric with stretch. We also have thin stretch and thin normal, so several different options. Let's select normal material right now, Nina K, on our okay. sewing advisor. It's already there. Oh, it's already there. Great. Yes. But the letter B, that button, would select our material, right? Yes. Okay. Then the arrows will actually take us through, step by step, everything we need to know to sew. And so you'll notice that Nina K touched the arrow that was scrolling down, and it says needle and it tells us exactly what needles to have in. Now, owners of the four thread models, or the model 1000L, will have only the left and right needle mentioned. But if you have the five thread model, 1001, it will also talk about a front needle, but it'll always tell you which ones to use, right? Exactly That's right. right. And what size to put in according to the weight of your fabric. It's super. Okay, let's touch that arrow again to step two, because when we bring up step two, it's going to actually talk about the type of thread recommended for the loopers, and it's also going to talk about the order in which we should be threading the loopers. Um, they're color-coded, so you can't lose. And of course, it says to thread the green first in this case, which is our upper looper, and then the blue, the lower looper. The type of thread for normal sewing that's called for is synthetic, and of course, that would be a standard type cone or regular sewing thread that basically is a fine weight sewing polyester or polyester core thread for your regular sewing. Occasionally, it'll talk about texturized thread, and that's going to be a woolly nylon type. And so uh, using the right thread is really recommended because in essence you'll see that that has to do with all the rest of the settings. Let's move on to the next step, which says step three, thread for needles. And it'll again tell us the type of thread to use, synthetic in this case, and which needles to thread first, red and then yellow. It's so easy. 
Step four, this is the one you're going to love. It tells us exactly where to set the tension dials. And in this case, of course, four, 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 four for normal. And there's a little blank on this five thread, meaning that our fifth thread is not in use. Um, let me mention, Nanaka, I know you know this, that these tension settings are really just recommended. And depending on the type of thread and the weight of the fabric, you may need to adjust slightly. But in essence, we know that this is a great starting point, and we'll just have some minor adjustments to make if we need anything, right? Exactly right. Well, what does it scroll to next? We'll go to the dial settings. And tell us about the dials. The dials are located in the front. The first one is our differential feed settings. The next is our stitch length. And then we have our stitch width settings. And we'll be explaining those later on the tape. OK, Nina, now we'll go to setting six. And that talks about stitch finger, am I right? Yes. And it also talks about the converter letter. Let's talk about the stitch finger. Can you explain a little bit about a stitch finger? What the stitch finger is, is on your um, husky lock, you have a metal finger where the looper threads loop over this finger to adjust your stitch width. Mm -hmm. And it, it's what keeps it from puckering up, like on a standard machine, too. And I know that we have a wide stitch finger for normal sewing, and we also have a narrow stitch finger for rolled edge and specialty techniques. And the great thing about your new Husky Lock is that you can actually swing the wide one out, meaning to move it to the right, for the specialty sewing of rolled edge, or leave it in place, having it to the left, so you won't ever have to change plates or fiddle around. It's so easy, and we'll be explaining that. So what's it recommending for normal sewing? Um, to have the stitch finger to the left. Okay, to have the stitch finger over to the left. And then the next setting talks about a converter lever. Now, we won't need to know about this really till we get to two thread sewing, but where is that located? Just so we, we know that now. It's just located above here, above the upper looper. And what are the two settings? Up or down. Up or down. Show us, uh, show us that if you would, because I think that's important to see that that little lever goes down or pop it up for us, or it goes up. And so in most cases, except for two-thread sewing, it would be up. And, but we don't ever need to know that because our sewing advisor will tell us that's what's so great. Okay, step seven. What does it tell us in step seven? Whether presser foot. I think this is so neat. It suggests the right presser foot for the technique. And, of course, we'll be showing you snapping those off and on. And in addition to that, it tells us whether our cutter should be up or down. You know, while we're talking about the cutter, Let's show them how to lower the cutter. We seldom do this, but we might do it for cleaning more than anything else. So we would actually swing open the side of our husky lock. And yes, what we would do then is just push in on that little lever. And oh, look at the cutter go down. Amazing. OK, so keep in mind that you want that cutter up whenever the sewing advisor says to have it up so that you don't have any train wrecks, right? I've been known to maybe put my cutter down and uh, forget to put it back up. It's really important to put it up when you're doing normal sewing and you want to trim. OK, now that's the end of the settings on the 4-thread model 1000L, but you will find an additional setting on the 5-thread. Let's show them what that is. The last setting is actually telling you a cutter cover number, and we'll talk about that later, and a chain stitch lever. So, We'll talk about all those settings toward the end of this tape for the five thread sewers that have model 1001. Until then, every technique that we explain will be exactly the same, whether you have the model 1001L, 1000L, or 1000. The 1000 owners will need to follow step by step either with the videotape or step by step with the instruction book or their handbook because there is no sewing advisor to reference. I know there's a couple other things that appear on this sewing advisor. Maybe we could just tell them about them. Uh, your new Husky Lock won't sew when the presser foot is up. I love it. Raise that presser foot and step on the foot control, 9 k and show them what happens. The sewing advisor actually says lower presser foot. So you can't make that mistake. It will tell you to lower the presser foot. And the other thing that may appear at one time on your uh, sewing advisor would be motor overload. If you ever hit a pin or something heavy, it will, your husky lock will stop sewing and you simply take out the problem and start sewing again. Let's talk about some of the elements for successful stitching. I know we want to use 
quality thread when we're sewing, okay? And we do have for you some information in the handbook about choosing thread types, but let's talk about actually threading the husky lock, and I'm gonna turn it over to you, Nina Kay, to help them with that. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and just go ahead and clip the threads on this, on the husky lock right now. And with the presser foot automatically up, it automatically releases the tension, so it makes freeing the threads very easily. And then to start threading, you always start threading with your upper looper. Now I notice you're using cone thread. What about other kinds of thread? Oh, you can use all sorts of different types of threads. Like I know we have quite a few here, but there are some things that come with it. Exactly. With the cone thread, there is actually a, um, a holder for your cone thread, which simply slides onto your thread holder. That keeps that cone from vibrating, doesn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. And then if you're working with regular spools of thread, we have what's called spool caps that simply um, place on top of the spools to prevent the thread getting caught in the, the niches and have even feeding. That is so important. And then if you're working with like a, a sulky rayon thread or a thread that comes on a spool like so, you can actually simply place the net on there for easy feeding of the thread and prevents it from falling down and getting caught. Okay, so these are some good suggestions to be sure you don't have thread problems. Exactly. So the first step in threading, we'll actually place our cone thread onto our thread holder. Then we're going to bring our thread up to the top of the thread guide, down through the clip. We're going to place it through our tension disc, and then we'll actually remove this front and open up the front and bring it, the thread down through the lay-in threading. Then there's a, actually a hook down here below, which follow the diagrams, which are color-coded down in the front, on the side, and then there's another thread guide, and then thread through the upper looper. So next we're going to go with our lower looper, which is place our cone thread onto the thread holder and bring it up through th another thread guide. Bring it down through the clip, through the tension discs, down through the thread, laid in threading. Simply pull down the lower looper, it's self threading. Pop it in to the little hook and snap it right in. So no, have, uh, you don't have to go behind anywhere, it just simply pops right in and then thread it through the lower looper eye. So that is so fast. And we're threading now for four thread sewing. First the green upper looper, then the blue lower looper. And what did our sewing advisor tell us was next? Next we go to our needles. Right. And then we'll go with our right needle. Once again, bring it up. Mm -hmm. Can we over. show them a little trick to get into that tension pole right? Definitely, because a lot yeah. of people get this confused. Right. Just simply bring it in front of the pole and just drop it down. I know, you bring it into the front and then it comes from the back. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> right, because people are always trying to pull mm -hmm. it through. So then put it through the clip, mm -hmm. down through the tension disc, follow the arrows just all the way around, and then thread through the eye of the needle. That's great. And of course they may want to get their tweezers out if it's easier to grab it. In any case, there are tweezers with your husky lock and you may want to pull those out of the, the little accessory box and use those to help you grab a hold of that thread to pull it to the back. Next is with our left needle. Once again, bring the thread up through the guide, down through the clip, through the tension disc. Once again, just follow around the arrows. It's marked uh, with a yellow color, an L for left needle, and go ahead and thread through the needle. Nina K, you have made this so easy. I'm sure that all our friends at home with their Husky Locks are going to feel very comfortable sitting down and working on their new Husky Lock and get it threaded up in just minutes. And now, Nina, how do we start sewing? We simply select our fabric, have our presser foot raised, lay our fabric underneath, lower the presser foot, and just start searching. Okay, and I usually do suggest when you're test sewing that you start just a little bit slower. And you'll notice that we have actually set our Husky Lock on slow speed right here on the side. We have fast speed, which sews at 1,500 stitches a minute, and slow speed, which sews at around 700 maximum. 
But of course, the wonderful thing about the new Husky Lock is that regardless of which speed you're set on, you actually have stitch by stitch control thanks to the electronics and full penetration power through all weights and all thicknesses of fabric. Well, let's take a look at your stitch. <laughs> Isn't this great? That fourth thread uh, is just beautiful and amazing. That tension setting that was recommended by our sewing advisor, 4444, is perfect, isn't it? With standard thread. Exactly, because how you can tell that it's a perfect stitch is that your upper looper threads are meeting at the top to meet your lower looper threads. You know, we probably should talk about that. As you look at your Husky Lock stitch, you're going to see on the top side the upper looper thread and on the bottom side the lower looper thread. Now if they're not meeting at the edge, for example, if that top thread was yanked around to the other side, the underside, we have too much pull or too much tension on the lower looper. We would simply reduce it. Keep in mind this is all explained in your handbook and in your instruction book and I will share that we usually recommend that when you're first sewing through your handbook and learning your Husky Lock, you actually use four different t colors of thread. One for each different threading that match the color coding for the loopers and the needles. And then you know exactly which thread is which till you, till you learn a little bit more about that whole stitch capability. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I'll take that. That's a perfect four thread for my workbook. And let's go on now and talk about the next step, which is to teach how to change stitch length. Okay. What are we going to do first? Okay, we simply come to our front dial adjustment. We're going to actually go to our longest stitch length by bringing it up to five millimeters. Place our fabric underneath, and we're only going to sew about a fourth of the way down. This is our really long length. Exactly. Now, we want to go to probably what we'll use for normal sewing, which will be at three millimeters long. I love the way they have all the normal settings marked with actually a little colored block, right? The white block. Right. And then the next step, we're going to go to our shortest stitch length, which is setting it R, which normally stands for World Edge, but we'll talk more about that. But this is our shortest stitch length. And you probably would never sew a four thread overcast at R, would you? Very seldom. Okay. Great. Maybe we could hold that out for everyone to see how those stitch lengths changed. Uh-huh. Wow. Quite a, quite a difference, isn't it, from the real long down to the real short. Good. Well, now we understand stitch length, and the next thing to understand is changing the stitch width. Yes. The, we want to go back to our normal stitch length first, and then we'll go to our stitch width. First, we'll start with um, our narrowest stitch width with stand standings for R, which once again we'll use in rolled edge. Once again, I only sew a quarter of a way down. Then I'll go up to five millimeters wide. Sew a little bit more and then go to six millimeters. And finish on seven millimeters. So this is just a way for everyone to experiment a little bit with the different settings of the width of the stitch. It's almost a little hard to see, but I do notice that we're getting some looping off the edge, aren't we? Yes. Can we fix that? Oh, very easily. Let's share how. This is our fine-tuned stitch width adjustment. This is the greatest thing about your new husky. Like, I have to tell you this because you don't have to get a screwdriver out to adjust the cutter if you ever get loops off the edge or pleats within the stitch. How do we adjust the fine-tuned cutting, 9 k If you notice, we have numbers 7, but above that 7, we have a triangle. Now, as we come up towards the wider part of that triangle, what that's going to do is actually going to stitch more. It's actually going to cut less fabric away, isn't it? Yes. So we won't get that looping because there will be more fabric within the stitch. And uh, this is a really great feature uh, that you can adjust the fine tune of the width. We actually, on the, in this case, went too far. And so we could fine tune it back about halfway down that triangle. Do you want to do it about halfway and run us another one? Okay. But Truly, you will that? so enjoy this feature because it means every time you sew with your new Husky Lock, the stitch will be perfect. The other 
thing we should mention is that really that wide, wide width probably would not be used on a light or medium fabric. Right. It's more for decorative sewing and would be used more on the heavier fabrics. But I think they understand the concept of the fine adjustment. Let's share how to secure ends. And I think for that, let's go back to our normal settings of three length and five width. And of course, differential feed at this time remains at one. And what are we doing here? And what we're going to do, we're going to start surging, but we're going to tie off those ends. So once we start surging, we're going to just take a few stitches in, then bring around the tails that we had chained off earlier, swing around underneath the presser foot, lower our presser foot once again, and surge. And we're catching those loose ends that we just surged off. And then as we come down to the end, we want to secure the end. Mm -hmm. So we simply take one stitch off the end, Okay. Simply raise the presser foot, and remember when we raise the presser foot, it automatically releases the tension. So it makes it easier to simply pull the stitches off the stitch finger, swing the fabric back underneath the presser foot, mm -hmm. and we're going to actually have it where the needles will pierce back down into the fabric, lower the presser foot, and start surging. So on. you sew kind of back over what you've already sewn. Yes. To finish it off. Great. So we've trapped the threads at this end. Yeah. And we've trapped them at the other end. Super. Uh, you don't do this too often in surging, because a lot of times you actually sew back over where you've surged. But I can see that that would be a big help. You know, we've been talking a lot about the four thread overlock. And I have a sample down here that I'd like to share with everyone. And this basically is a jacket that I know you're working on, Nina K, yeah. made out of denim, all right? And uh, this would be an example of the way our <laughs> seams could look, right? And we have a couple of options with our four thread seam overcast. We can sew the seams and overcast them all at one time, which is what you've done here, and then press them to one side. Or on a jacket, probably the preference on a heavier fabric would be to actually finish those seams first and then sew the seam on your Viking with a straight stitch and press them open for better hang. This would give better hang. So those are some of the uses of the actual four thread overcast in garment construction. Now, let us uh, go and talk about some of the other techniques. We're still on four thread overcast. This is the one you're going to use a lot. What about outside corners? Well, you'll have to be going around outside cor corners depending on what type of project you're doing, but we'll just start around one edge of the corner and just start surging. And we'll get to at the edge of the corner and actually I like to hand crank them about one stitch off the end. Mm -hmm. Once again, raise that presser foot. It's uh, releasing the tension settings. And then simply swing your fabric around to the unstitched edge. Now lower the presser foot. And the little trick that I do now is kind of tug up my threads. Okay. And I'm pulling up the slack that I just, as I had pulled the stitches off that stitch finger before, and just start surging once again. Mm -hmm. Now this does take practice to do. Okay. And so we're actually going to be going around corners. Yes. And you might even do this with other techniques like rolled edge, right? Yes, that's why I use it the most. Okay. Now let's press on and talk about inside corners. Well, to show a real easy technique, I'm just going to simply cut its block out first. All right. And you might be using this like in a kick pleat or um, on a slit of some sort. I use this in plackets a lot. Plackets, for sleeves. yes, mm -hmm. that's an excellent mm -hmm. place to use that. Now, a little trick, because when we start surging, we'd be coming straight down. Well, we would start cutting into our fabric at that point. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So we want to try to pull our fabric straight. Well, sometimes with it just cut like that, it doesn't necessarily um, pull straight. So I simply clip into the corner slightly and maybe take a little few clips but very small clips because you don't want to cut into your fabric too much. Simply start surging and pull your fabric straight. Okay, so you pull that actual corner into a straight line. Yes. Oh, and I could see that that clipping helped you a lot, didn't it, to get around there. So you just don't clip in any further than the seam is wide. That would be important. Exactly. Okay, so we've done inside corners. Both of these techniques we want to be sure that we're not cutting. In other words, when you're sewing an outside corner or when you're sewing an inside corner, have those edges already trimmed. It's impossible 
to move around a corner and cut with the cutter on your husky lock because it's actually in front of the needle sewing. And so you'll just have a slit, so we want to take care. Uh, also in your book, it does talk about doing slits, but we, we know you saw that that's done the same way. Let's talk about casing and self-hem or hem fold. This is one of the greatest techniques. I actually have a sample of this, and uh, I thought they might like to see. I used to think when I bought garments that this casing was added, was a separate piece added to the garment. This is a knit skirt, and instead, my elastic is in this skirt edge, and Nina K is going to show us how we can do this so instantly you won't believe it. So show us, Nina K, how easily that's done. Simply fold up your fabric for your hem or for your casing, and then we're just going to fold it back. So we're going to have about a half inch of an edge hanging over. Simply place it underneath our presser foot mm -hmm. and start surging. Now we're going to be trimming away about that half inch of fabric that I had folded back there. And then we'll be catching on the fold, but we really don't want to trim away the fabric at the fold. This is like doing a blind hem from a folding standpoint, but with blind hem we don't want to catch much. This time we want to catch that fold really well, right? Yes. And so here's what looks from the wrong side, but isn't that going to be a time saver for making casings at the top of skirts and pajamas for the kids? And it also can be a little cuff at the bottom of a sleeve as well. Yes. Boy, I'll tell you, I know everybody's going to enjoy that one, and it's going to save them a great deal of time in all of their sewing. We have a ribbing technique for you next. And uh, if you've ever made t-shirts or sweatshirts, you know that ribbing is a fast finish for knit or woven, really. How do we go about doing ribbing? Well, actually, in the sample, I'll simply cut out a little neckline with the scissors. Okay. And then we're going to take ribbing and fold the ribbing in half, the lengthwise. We're going to lay the ribbing right to the right side of the sweatshirt fabric, mm -hmm. and we're going to start surging. And as we start surging, we're going to actually be kind of stretching that ribbing as we go to fit the neckline. So in your pattern, of course, we have a pattern usually where we have a recommended ratio of how much shorter the ribbing should be. Yes. My suggestion always is be sure it pulls over your head. That's a good <laughs> recommendation, Sue. And that's what looks on the wrong side, and here's what it looks like on the right side. Boy, that is so professional. We could make quick little garments for the kids. It would be so much fun, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, I know this actually completes our section on four-thread sewing uh, without differential feed, but I want to share that you can also use four-threads with some of the pretty decorative threads. And I have my Glacier sweatshirt here to share where we've actually used metallic thread on the upper looper, and we've used black thread uh, on the lower looper, and turquoise in one needle, and burgundy in another needle to create some seminal patchwork. So keep in mind that your surging can show and can be used for decorative purposes as well. Well, the next section we'd like to talk about is differential feed. And I know this is an invaluable tool for you in your surging. People always ask me, just what does differential feed mean? And in essence, differential feed is used when you're working with specialty fabrics or for specialty techniques. Your Husky Lock has two feed teeth that go like this, pushing the fabric underneath the foot. And in essence, they work together at a one-to-one -one ratio when your differential feed is set on one. But when we set the differential feed, for example, on two, <laughs> the front feed teeth feed twice as fast as the back. Or when we set them on 0.7, these front feed teeth feed slower, and it gives you the effect of sewing taut, like when you hold fabric in front of and behind the needle. So let's cover a few of the reasons that we would want to use differential feed. The first one being surging lightweight, silky type wovens. I know sometimes we get puckering, Nina K, when we sew those. So let's uh, use our sewing advisor, shall we? And look at the four thread overcast, which we're set on. Let's tell it we're sewing on normal thin fabric, in our okay. thin fabric. And what does it tell us to do um, as far as moving along? We just can work our way through. But I'm going to tell you that it may not recommend that we change the differential feed. And Nina K is going to adjust the tension according to 
but differential feed it says 1. So let's try it because the example I want you to know is that you can at any time override what your sewing advisor recommends if you need to. And here you see we have a four thread surge and it's just a little puckery, right? A little bit. <laughs> and that might happen, particularly on a single layer. So let's set our differential feed to 0.7 and that means we'll be sewing taut. And sew down the other side of that piece of silky fabric that you're using there. And here you see that we've eliminated those puckers and we have a nice flat stitch on this very lightweight single layer. So remember that if you're sewing a silky that tends to pucker a little bit to set that differential feed to 0.7. So now let's talk about surging stretch knits. And uh, boy, I have a good example of that here. This is a, an outfit I made a few years ago, and it was very, very stretchy, uh, all kind of a rib knit. And I'll tell you that without differential feed, I really would have had a totally stretched out neck, a totally stretched out seam. And let's share what happens, Nina K. Put our differential feed back to normal and let's sew with our differential feed at normal down one side of that stretchy knit that you have. And maybe we should fold it in two as though we were seaming a sweater. Okay, let me adjust my tensions here because our sewing visor is telling us to have different t uh, tension settings back to four. Okay, so according to the weight of the fabric, great. Okay, I don't know. That, that looks a little stretched out. What do you think? <laughs> I, I wouldn't want that in my sweater. No, we wouldn't want that in our sweater. Well, let's set that differential feed to two, which means those front feed teeth are feeding twice as fast, pushing in that sweater knit. And what happens when we go down the other side? What a difference, huh? This is what I want my sweater to look like, that nice flat seam. Great for differential feed. Now the next differential feed technique we'll share is gathering. And whether you're using gathering for home deck, for pillows, or for curtains, or maybe it's for garment sewing. I actually have a skirt here that I've done where I gathered up the bottom part of the skirt and then put it onto my yoke. And uh, this was done with the differential feed gathering technique. So Nina K, we'll be doing this on a normal material and you might want to tell our sewing advisor that, but truthfully this is one of those times that we're going to override the sewing advisor settings for length and differential feed for a specialty type technique. So if you'll set our length at 5 and our differential feed at 2, okay? And that is going to make it gather up. And of course, we're still there differential feed too from our sweater knit, aren't we? <laughs> yes. And of course, I noticed you put our width down to normal width, which would be good. Okay, what do we do next? I'm just going to use um, a strip of fabric, place it underneath our presser foot, and just start surging. And look how it gathers up automatically. Isn't that amazing? So that differential feed just causes that to just gather up. It it's just does a great job. Now, for additional gathering, you could increase the needle tension, mm -hmm. or you could also kind of hold your finger back behind the foot to make it gather a little bit more. Both, yes. are, both are options for additional gathering. But uh, that finishes, really, our differential feed techniques, doesn't it? Yes. And now we're ready to go on to something totally different, the three thread overlock. So maybe you could tell our song advisor and bring up that technique. Simply touch the three thread. And, and uh, I know we're going to use just a, a normal fabric, normal material the first time. So let's advise and it tells us to remove our right needle. Notice we have two screws so we simply loosen the right needle. Always keep um, the needle threaded as I remove it 
So for the, in case I accidentally slip and drop the needle down, down it will not completely fall into the serger, so I won't have to um, take it out. You can fish it out again with the thread. That's a good idea. You know, I'll mention here too, after you take that needle out, be sure to tighten the screw again because that screw can, if it's too loose, vibrate out as we're doing our three-thread sewing. So tighten up the screw after you remove the needle. Good idea. Okay, now we're ready to set up, and would you like to check our settings that are recommended? Now, after removing the needles, we'll go ahead and touch again and see what it says. We have our upper and lower loopers threaded, and only our left needle is threaded. And now set our tension settings. We're going to decrease our needle to three, decrease our upper looper to three, and keep our lower looper at tension setting four. Then we'll go down to our controls in the front and bring our differential feed back to 1.0, which you is know, it normal. Okay. I, I'm going to interject something here. I think it'd be good if we mentioned to everyone that it is a lot easier to turn those dials if you have the presser foot up. So we should be sure to mention that for you. And then also your stitch length will bring it back down to normal and our stitch width at five. Okay, so maybe we can review just a little bit. We're following the sewing advisor and it's basically giving us the tension settings for three thread sewing. And then it is suggesting that we set the width, the length and the differential feed at normal. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then make sure that our stitch finger is to the left and our converter lever is up. Great. And so we're all set. What foot are we using still? We're still using our LR5 presser foot, the original one that we started out with. Okay, we should probably explain on the 5 thread 1001, it would be the LR5, which is your standard sewing foot. And on your 4 thread models, 1000L and 1000, the foot would be the LR4. So don't be confused by that. And we're ready to go. Okay. So just, I'm going to search through one single layer because usually when you use a three thread searched edge, you're using it just to finish an edge on a woven fabric or using it to construct garments on knit fabrics. Okay, so this kind of is your stretchiest stitch and also is often used for the finishing when you're going to sew the garment then with a straight stitch later. Great, so we've stitched a three thread overcast or it could be a three thread seam. Uh, the next step is safe lock, and tell us about safe lock, Nina Kay. Actually, what we're going to do is search a three threads seam, and then we're going to go to our Viking number one and sew a straight seam over the side to make it look almost kind of like a um, flat lock. So we'll sort of explain that. This is great for reversible garments. Okay, so that would be our three thread seam. Mm -hmm. And then what would we do? We'll go to the sewing machine and simply stitch a straight line along. Mm -hmm. Or five thread owners could do that with their chain stitch too, yes. couldn't they? Mm -hmm. Good idea. Well, Nina Kay, I know one of the things that a lot of people do with their husky lock is blind stitch, or actually blind hem. And I know that's one of the techniques, blind stitch, on our sewing advisor, right? Yes, so let's simply touch the A button. And we're bringing up the technique of blind stitch. Mm -hmm. And what fabric will we do this on? We'll be working on a normal stretch fabric, okay, like a sweatshirt so fleece type fabric. Great, and then let's go through the setup, because it's a little different, I think. We'll have in our left needle, which is already there and use our upper and lower looper. So we're still threaded for three thread overcast or overlock, which we have been. Right. Mm -hmm. Now our tension settings are going to change. We're going to bring our needle down to setting a four, mm -hmm. our upper looper to nine, and our lower looper to five. Okay. Our differential feed is going to be at one, stitch length three, or you may want to lengthen that too. Yeah, I agree. I tend to lengthen my stitch a little bit on the blind stitch. So you, you can really play with that and vary it as you feel the need. Mm -hmm. And your stitch width at normal is setting at five. Great. Then our stitch fingers to the left and converter is up. Now press her foot. Ah. We can also use the blind hem foot. 
Yes, I see that our sewing advisor calls for a foot that we haven't used before, the LB, in this case, 5, because we're on the 5-thread machine. And on the model 1000L, it would be the LB4 foot. And uh, do you have one of those there? Yes, yeah, in my accessory box. Okay. And let's talk a little bit about how to exchange the presser feet, because we really haven't covered that. They're so easy to snap off and on. Located back behind the presser foot is a little button. Mm -hmm. Simply depress the button, and it simply drops off the presser foot. And the super nice thing about our Husky Lock is the fact that we have on the presser foot lift, it actually has an extra little lift. So you simply lift that, turn the presser foot sideways, slide it out. Great. Mm -hmm. and we're going to place on the presser foot. Now to put it back on, give it once again that little extra lift, slide the presser foot underneath, mm -hmm. sideways, and just lower the presser foot and it snaps right on. Boy, that was sure easy. I'll bet that extra lift with the presser foot lever helps with heavy fabrics too, getting them under, doesn't it? Yes. Good. Okay, what's next? We're ready to sew. But oh. first we probably need to fold our fabric and there's a certain way to fold for a hem. Like for example, we're folding up for an a regular hem, but now we're going to fold back where we have a little ledge. Okay. And another little trick I like doing is using I found your scissors. scissors thanks. Yeah. Trim away just a little bit at the beginning because this part is going to be trimmed away and I like having the fabric underneath the presser foot when I start surging. That's a really good tip. There are other times we want to use that so we can get right up to the needle to start sewing without cutting on that little first section. And we'll just start surging. Now what does this foot do for us? It's actually um, giving us a nice guide that okay. we follow. Could you stop a minute and maybe sure. we could tell people about that. Do you see the little roller on the foot? Uh, over to, yes, that roller. Actually, that will move the guide from left to right. And so as you're sewing, you can look right where that needle is catching. And we want to just barely catch into the fold, and we can adjust the guide so that we're catching more or less fabric, right? Yes. And so this is similar to the blind hem on your Viking, and it's especially nice on knits and things. Okay, so there's our hem. Isn't that great? And of course, I imagine the idea would be to use matching thread, right? Yes, and, and not pink on blue. Yeah. Turn that over and let's see the back side so we see how it looks on the back. Great. So we've actually stitched up the hem, and I see why the tension's changed, because it kind of pulls it around, doesn't it? Hmm. Well, that's super. We've done the blind hem. And I know the next technique in our book is actually decorative sewing. Now let's go through taking the foot off again. I think it would okay. be valuable to show that one more time. Simply press the button, mm -hmm. turn it sideways, give it that extra little lift with the presser foot, okay. and slide it back. Uh huh. And sometimes that hook snaps off, just put it back on. All right, and then this is decorative sewing. I imagine our sewing advisor will tell us what foot to use. We've stepped ahead a little bit. Should we bring up decorative sewing? Decorative okay. threads. Mm -hmm. We're ready, and we'll be using on. Um, is it on heavyweight fabric? It's on actually normal. Mm -hmm. Normal material. Okay. There we go. And we're going to leave in our left needle. Mm -hmm. We could use. Um, they suggest textured uh, thread in our loopers. So I think I'll, we'll use a decorative thread. Let's try a real pretty one. I agree. I know you've got some. Very pretty. Uh, there's all kinds of beautiful decorative threads today. So you're going to rethread just the upper looper, is that correct? And I also clip my needle threads too. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is because sometimes it to prevent prevent the thread lower thread from breaking. So in other words, you're you're actually threading in the order as recommended, and you, so you're not having the needle threaded when you thread the looper. Okay. And so we've got a real pretty thread. The wonderful thing is that the eyes on the loopers are big, a lot bigger than the eyes in needles. And for that reason, the decorative threads can go through those large eyes. Now, I have a couple of pretty samples while you're doing that, Nina K. Um, here's a gold metallic thread that's been done on the edge of a little napkin that's folded like a Christmas tree. That's a real fun one, some metallic edging. 
And of course, this eliminated the need for a hem or for any other finishing. We just surged around the edge. You can see how fast that went. And then underneath it, a little hanger cover that is finished quilted fabric, finished with a really heavy uh, ribbon floss yarn type thread. And I do have an example of that here to show you. And that's what's so neat, that you can use all these different types of threads. And then one more, the cutout placemats. I'll tell you what fun. You just purchase them and surge around the edges. This allows you to finish them so quickly with the decorative threads. This one with a sulky green on one side and red on the other side. So you really could finish this off so quickly and have a gift, a wonderful gift for someone. Now, uh, what are our tension settings at? Because we're using a thicker thread, we may not always abide by just what the sewing advisor says. Is that true? Very true. We may want to loosen it. However, it does give us uh, good recommendations because our needle threads at four, our upper looper is at two, and we may want to drop that even down to one, depending on the weight of fabric we're working with. And I believe I'll go ahead and do that now. You mean the weight of the thread? Right. Yeah, maybe I could give them my little recommendation on that. Um, anytime you're using a decorative thread in a looper, the rule of thumb is the heavier the thread, the lower you set your tension. In other words, if it's a real heavy thread, then sometimes you'll be right at zero. And if it's a standard weight, like a sulky rayon thread, you might be at the normal setting as recommended for the sewing, on the sewing advisor. Of course, that's because those tension discs are pinching the thread, and the real heavy goes through real slowly if they're too pinched. So we just loosen it up a little bit. So the lower the number, the heavier the thread. Okay, okay. we're ready to sew? Well, it gives us a recommendation that we need to shorten our stitch length. And we may want to increase our stitch width, too. Sure, to have a real pretty wide edge. That's fun. And then did it tell us to put our regular foot back on? You've already done that, huh? Yes. Great, great. So everything we need to know is right there on that sewing advisor. Oh, you're going to do a little quilted placemat. A little miniature. It could be a coaster. Uh-huh. So in other words, as you sew on a scrap, that's a good idea. Always practice on a scrap like this before you work on your regular uh, placemat. Just take a little scrap of what you've trimmed away and finish it off. Isn't that pretty? Beautiful decorative. The next thing we're going to do is rolled edge. And it is so nice that our sewing advisor, Nina, will tell us everything we need to know to set up for rolled edge. So maybe you could walk us through. Simply find rolled edge on our sewing advisor. We do that with the A button. A button. And then we need to select the type of fabric we're going to be working on. I'm going to be working on a lightweight woven fabric. I have a question. If we brought up heavy fabric on this, what would happen? Well, let's find out. Oh, it says combination not acceptable, right? Exactly. So we would not want to do rolled edge. That's, That's so right. great. It's actually So gonna... it thinks for us. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the right one. But I thought maybe somebody might get that flash at them. And it's generally because that technique is not recommended for that weight of fabric. You could override it and try it, but don't know what you're going to expect result-wise. Exactly. Okay. So now we need to have in the right needle. And I have in the left needle right now, so I'm going to need to switch my needles over. Okay. So for rolled edge, we use the right needle only. Correct. Okay, and that is what our sewing advisor told us. And one other thing I might mention about needles that's very important, and that is that when you are putting the needle into your husky lock, be sure you loosen the screw far enough and be sure the needle is in all the way. If you're ever having a problem, try loosening the needle and pushing it up again because it needs to be in all the way, and then try rethreading. We all set? Mm -hmm. And then our next is going to tell us to use a texturized thread. And for a rolled edge, I think we're going to try a woolly nylon today. Okay. So I'll go ahead and clip this thread. And where do we use that? Use the woolly nylon in your upper looper. Okay. I'll take this decorative pretty thread. Okay, and we'll save that for later. And then we'll go ahead and we'll thread our upper and lower looper. Should okay. we go ahead and do that Let's now? thread the upper looper for sure. We okay. can probably just leave the lower looper. We've already shown how to thread that, but obviously, since we're changing to texturized thread, we'll have to thread the upper looper. 
sometimes you might use a silky sulky type thread, a rayon, also in the upper looper. The thing to think about in rolled edge is whatever thread is on the upper looper is the thread that's going to show, right? <laughs> exactly. So that's the thread that will be wrapped around the edge. You know, I do have a few samples of rolled edge here that I'd like to share. Maybe while you're threading that, I could bring those up and we could take the time to talk a little bit about them. Um, most of the time, people think of rolled edge for napkin edges and things. And I've got a kind of a nifty napkin edge here. By the way, this is the napkin that everybody has somebody in their life that needs a napkin with a buttonhole in the corner <laughs> that can be buttoned on to cover the tie or the blouse. But you see how that rolled edge has covered the edge and finished off that napkin so beautifully. Another thing you might use rolled edge for would be tucks, and I have a really pretty camisole that I thought you might enjoy seeing, and this has little rolled edge tucks on it, and you get the idea of stitching rolled edge on the fold and creating beautiful tucks on that camisole or on a pillow. And then I know there are some other techniques that we will be sharing, so while you're doing that, I'll show the little lettuce edge, which is a stretched out rolled edge. <laughs> and you can see the little ruffles created around the neck and down at the bottom of this little girl's dress, and also on the panties uh, with the sulky thread in the upper looper, and then sewing, as we'll show you in a minute, with the differential feed stretching the fabric. So these are all techniques created with rolled edge. So what's next? Well, after we've um, rethread our upper looper, it then also tells us um, to thread with the right needle. So we need to unthread our needle and change the position of our cone thread. Okay, so this is done with three threads. Yes. Mm -hmm. I sometimes have used the clear thread uh, in, the, in the needle and sometimes in the lower looper. And even in the upper looper, if I wanted invisible rolled edge uh, with a longer pico length on some scarves and things. So that's another option for rolled edge sewing. Now the other thing we could mention about rolled edge is that it gives you tremendous possibilities, not only for home deck, but also for clothing. And think about it for hems, where you want no buildup or turn, for example, on silkies. Okay, what, what's next? Our tension settings. So we need to be at three for our right needle, three for our upper looper, and six for our lower looper. Wow, that's what makes it pull under, isn't it? Yes. And roll, okay. Next, our differential feed back at normal, 1.0. And this time we need our stitch length at R mm -hmm. and our stitch width at R, which R standing for rolled edge. Great. Okay. Now this is something that's different, and that's where we're going to need to move our stitch finger. We're, it says to move it to the right. So there's, there's a guard down here below, a knob, that we're going to need to actually turn to remove the stitch finger. Now I know there is a trick, you mentioned the guard, unless the upper looper is down all the way in the lowest position, you can't turn that, right? Exactly, so you have it in the lowest position, depress the guard, mm -hmm. turn the knob. Look at the finger. And the stitch finger simply moves right out of the way. And that's that wide finger we talked about before, so now we're ready with the skinny finger to make a little roll, right? Exactly. Great. Is that it? That's it. Everything else is set and we're ready to sew. Mm -hmm. And I know you keep putting that little waist catcher back on. I love this so I don't have to pick up all the trimmings. Good idea. So can't you make this go faster? Is this a time when you'd like to use the yes. fast speed? <laughs> You're right, I do love those two speeds. Look at that nifty rolled edge. You know, that's a little narrow one, and actually you could increase the width a little bit if you wanted a wider rolled edge. I know a lot of people want the real narrow one, and you can see how that woolly nylon's wrapping way around. Now, if it doesn't wrap entirely around, increase your lower looper tension some to pull it around. 
And you will have to make some adjustments probably on tension depending on the type of threads you're using and the fabric you're working on, correct? Yes. Okay. Let's try a lettuce edge. That's our next technique in the book. And I know we, we do that on the little ribbing or mm -hmm. on a stretchy knit like on that little girl's dress. What do we do for this? Well, just start surging. And But first we want to activate that differential feed to 0.7. Okay, so we set our differential feed to hold it taut, and I'm going to suggest you do set the width maybe just a little wider for this, for a little okay. wider rolled edge, because it might be that we would want to, yeah, raise that presser foot, it's easier, right? might be that we would want a little wider decorative lettuce edge. Okay, let's see how it goes. So this will work on stretchy edges or right. stretchy folds. Right, and also, too, I do not want to trim away the fabric. Oh, okay, so you're not going to trim as you sew. You're going to sew right at the edge. Mm -hmm. Would you put your cutter down? You could, but I usually don't suggest that. Yeah, usually we just sew right along the edge of it and use it as a guide. Cute! And then we give it a little yank. Great, and there's our little roughly edge, like for a little girl's top or something. Isn't that fun? Okay. Well, that's really fun, and I know rolled edge does not have to be used at that real short stitch length, right? Right. We can increase that stitch length to do a pico edge. Okay, so shall we try a little longer stitch length of maybe three or so? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's go back, well, to our rolled edge width and maybe use our differential feed. Still at 0.7, I'll bet, because we're going to work on a silky fabric, right? Right. Okay. I use this setting often for rolled seams, like a French seam effect on heirloom sewn type garments, and it can work real well for that as well. But silky scarves, this is a wonderful technique to use. And of course there we're looking at the wrong side. Let's flip it over and look at the right side. Neat, you get that little ripply pico. Right now, we're going to set back our stitch finger and actually go to two thread sewing. And this is another technique that we would like to share with you. Um, in essence, sometimes you will want to use the two thread sewing for overcast and sometimes for flat lock. Let's do the flat lock first because I know that is on our sewing advisor, right? Yes. So what do we need to do? And we're going to be working on normal stretch. Okay, normal stretch fabric, like a sweatshirty type fabric? Yes. All right. And we need to remove the right needle and put in the left needle. Okay, so now we're going back to a wider stitch. Actually, you could do flat lock with a narrow stitch as well. You could, you could do it with the right needle, but most of the time you'll see it done decoratively. While you're doing that um, and threading up that needle, I think I'll share some samples that utilize the flat lock stitch. Uh, one is this little garment that's really cute. I'm going to take this cone out of the way, which has flat lock decorative work across the front of it in kind of a crisscross effect. And this used a decorative thread on the upper looper, which is what you see, not the upper looper, actually a decorative thread on the lower looper, which is what you see. And uh, in addition to that, we have a flat lock technique that's used to put lace around the neck of this little garment. And I, or actually, this is a little tidy towel, we call it, a little fun gift idea to make a little towel to give as a gift. But this flat lock actually attached the lace while we were flat locking. And one more sample of flat lock, because you'll see that it has lots of different options. And here it was used to do the insertion lace on this heirloom sewn by serger pillow top. So the flat lock stitch has a lot of different advantages, a lot of different things you can do with it. And Nina K, you got that needle all threaded, I see. Yes. Uh, what does it tell us to do next? It says to use um, only the lower looper. All right, so we're only threading the lower looper. What happens to the upper looper? Go ahead. Well, what we're going to do... I bet as we go through our sewing advisor, we'll see, right? Exactly. And we make sure that that's done. And then it's mm -hmm. going to tell us that we need a synthetic thread. It tells us our tension settings are zero on our needle, mm -hmm. five 
on our lower looper. Okay, and that's all we're using. Mm -hmm. Differential feed is a 1.0. Stitch length is three, and stitch width is going to be our widest. Oh, we're going to do a real wide flat lock. Mm -hmm. Okay. It says for the stitch finger to be to the left, so lower your upper looper to its lowest position. To press the guard on the stitch finger dial, simply turn the dial in so the stitch finger is in its left position again. Next thing it tells us to do is to have the converter lever down. Now that's located on our upper looper. Simply flip the switch and the converter is down. So therefore now we're ready to do our flat lock. You know, we might want to say that what that does by flipping that little lever down is fills the upper looper as though it were threaded. And so I always say it fakes it out so that uh, it thinks there's thread in there and then it will sew and form a stitch, but it'll actually do it with only two threads. And we use that converter for all two thread sewing. Right. Now we're ready to sew. Simply have a piece of folded fabric, place it underneath the presser foot, and now when the stitches start forming, the needle's only going to pierce on the edge of that fold of the fabric and going to actually loop off. So this does take a little practice, I'll bet. Yes. And uh, you might want to use the LB foot that we talked about earlier and set it to guide those loops dropping off the edge. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do we do next after we've stitched the seam? Or then the we fold? simply pull it flat. It's kind of like magic. Wow, it just pulls out flat. Now, we could have used decorative thread, couldn't we? Yes. And uh, the one thing to remember, as before with decorative thread, the heavier the thread, the lower the tension. So using a decorative thread would require some tension adjustment because it won't flow as freely through those tension discs. Good. Well, two thread flat lock. We've got that all finished. And I know uh, sometimes people use the flat lock to apply lace, and that's another technique in your book that you might want to try. And they also use it for over two thread sewing for overcasting. And it requires a little bit different tension setting. So, Nina K, if you'll work with me a little bit, we're going to use the same threading setup. All we're going to do is adjust the tension, and we're going to put our needle tension on zero and our looper tension on nine. And we're going to sew just along the edge of a piece of fabric. And it might be that if you had a very lightweight piece uh, that you're making, uh, this is what you would use. And would you want to adjust your stitch width back to normal? Yes, you probably would, mm -hmm. depending on the weight of what you're sewing. And this would save thread, too, if you didn't need the three thread or four thread overlock. Okay, because it has like a V effect on the back. You do see this some on ready-made clothing. Okay, that's our two thread overcast sewing. And uh, we're going to move on. I will say that you could do a two thread rolled edge, basically sewing the rolled edge with that converter in place. If you cared to, again, for a lightweight rolled edge on a silky scarf or a lightweight ruffle. But uh, we'll move on from here. And uh, owners of the Model 1000L and the Model 1000 may want to fast forward at this point to the portion on accessory feet. But those of you that own our five-thread model 1001L will stay with us because we are going to share right now about the five-thread sewing and also the two-thread chain sewing. So Nina K, I guess we can just trust our sewing advisor for everything we need to know, right? Mm -hmm. So if you'll just set us to five-thread overcast, we'll we can take it from there. Okay, we're going to do it for a normal weight fabric. Okay. So just normal material. We're going to remove our left needle and have in our right needle. And we're going to put in a front needle. Okay, and here's where it calls for a 9014. We want to be sure to use that size in the front. We should maybe mention while 9K is changing the needles that we do recommend Schmetz needles, only quality sewing machine needles in your new Husky Lock. And the Schmetz are very fine quality and will give you good results. So you're just loosening the screws, hmm? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the front needle. We haven't used that before. 
And uh, again, we should probably say that these go in always with the flat edge to the back. And Nina K is doing it. Loosen that screw far enough that you know that needle's in all the way. You could grip it with your tweezers if you felt you can't get a good enough hold on it with your fingers. And so our front needle is in place. And then what do we do? Next we need to thread our upper looper. Okay. Now I guess we do need to thread both those needles, don't we? Yes. <laughs> but first we're going to thread loopers. All right. Same threading process once again. Upper looper first. Mm-hmm. And something too I'm going to do is go ahead and clip my needle thread. One of the things that I think everyone will really love about their new Husky Lock is that it is so easy to thread. But of course, you can always tie on threads as well if you would like when you're threading or re-threading something that's already th threaded. Now, yeah, you did it. You have to release that converter from our last technique so you can get into the eye of that looper, don't you? Because when we bring that converter down, it actually has a little piece that fills the hole for us. Okay, so our upper looper's threaded. Okay, our lower looper is already threaded for us. Now we need to put on our converter. All right. We're adding a spool pin, actually, right? It just slides right onto the side. Okay. okay. Now it's time to go ahead and thread the chain stitch looper. Bring your thread up through the thread guide, through the clip, down through the tension. And the tension is located down here in the purple area. Now, one thing I want to mention, this groove is actually all the way to the right-hand side of the machine. And I noticed that in that little tension area, it has an N, which I'm sure is normal. Mm -hmm. And we line up the white line with the normal line. And that's where we'll use it virtually all the time, right? Yeah. OK. And bring it on underneath. Now, this time, we're going to be underneath the hook. Okay, and the other two were over that little guide. Right. I see. Mm-hmm. So it would be underneath. Now the next step, we're going to need to open up the side. Okay, so we open up the side. And this is where the lower looper guide is. And we're simply going to press this button up. Okay, so this is the chain stitch self-threading looper. Yes. When you press that up, if you can look over on the other side, you're going to see a little tiny hook come over where that looper is. Okay, now we haven't talked at all about this looper before. This is actually only used for chain stitch and for five thread sewing that has a chain stitch involved. So this is the chain stitch looper and that little hook. Now what do we do with that little hook there? We simply lay the thread into the hook and, and then now? come back to that gray button over on the other side and just bring it back down. You do want to be sure and bring that little gray button, which is your self-threading looper hook, back down into the position where it threads it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go ahead and thread through the looper. Okay, so now you're through the eye. And then what do you do with all these threads after you've threaded? I always make sure that I bring them up underneath the presser foot and out mm -hmm. to the side. Okay, and of course we can close the door. So close they're the all door. straight back under the foot. They're yes. not entwined in any way. No. All right. But also, too, we need to go ahead and thread our right, our front needle. So our, our sewing advisor would tell us that, right? Yes. I guess soon you're going to need another spool here, right? Yes. So I'll put that on for you. And so uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Okay. Now, actually, this is going to be your right needle. All right. You can actually see following the red color. Mm -hmm. Down, around, and up. So that's your right needle, mm -hmm. which is shown in red. Right for red, that makes sense. <laughs> Five thread sewing is actually what you'll see on a lot of ready made garments. It's a two thread chain with a three thread overcast right next to it. And that is something that you will want to do possibly on wovens and large flat projects such as drapes. 
Then what's the final step, Mina Kay? The thread, our front needle. Mm -hmm. Simply bring the thread through the clip again, down through. Now this time we're going to go up and over. You can actually see the F standing for front mm -hmm. needle. Okay. Bring it around. So it's a little bit higher than what we've been putting in for our regular left and right needles. Well, I notice there's a separate little guide right there just above the needle, too, for the front needle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here again, what do we do with these threads after we've threaded them? And this has its, actually its own little slit in the presser foot, and, and, but you just bring it underneath and back. Under the presser foot and toward the back, good. Okay, maybe I could show a little sample of what you've done. I know you're starting your jacket here. This is going to be a real interesting jacket with all the different techniques. Uh, you have it on denim, and this, is, this would be an excellent stitch for denim, wouldn't it, where we have the chain straight stitch uh, with your reinforcing next to a three-thread overcast. And you can see on the underside that chain and then the three-thread overcast next to it. Yes. All right. Now, what else does it tell us we need to do? Now our sewing advisor tells us that our tension settings need to be set at 4, 4, 5, 4, and in. So we'll go ahead and change our tension settings. We can always refer back to that sewing advisor, can't yes. we? Yes. Mm -hmm. And another uh, tension setting is talking about in, in standing for normal, which is the lavender tension settings down here in the corner. Okay. Now are we ready to sew? I believe so. Because all our other settings are, are ready to go. But it doesn't hurt to check them, does it? To make sure. And just place your fabric underneath and start serging. Great. So there's our five thread chain and our three thread overcast. Let's see the underside of that one. Great, Nina K. Well, there may be times that we would want to use that two thread chain by itself. And so for that reason, that is an option. And I will show you a sample uh, in a minute of that, but maybe Nina K, we could bring that up on the sewing advisor. How is that listed? As a chain stitch as a chain stitch, okay? And then what type of fabric will we sew it on? Um, let's do it on normal weight. Okay, normal material. And um, what does it tell us? That we need to have our front needle in and we need to remove that right needle. Okay, so we're only going to use one needle for this. One needle for chain stitch sewing. Okay, then what else? Then we only need to have our chain stitch looper threaded, which is the uh, color coded in purple. So we need to go ahead and clip our upper and lower loopers. Ah, so we're actually only going to again use two threads, but a different two this time. Uh, we'll be using our purple or chain stitch looper and our front needle. Okay. Mm -hmm. And our tension settings are at four and at in. Okay, so our sewing advisor tells us everything we need. And our differential feeds at normal, stitch length at three, and stitch width at five. Okay. Now our stitch finger is going to be to the left, and we're going to have our converter lever up. Now we need to we're take... We're using our regular foot. Regular foot, but we're going to have to take down the cutter. Ah, so, so we're, going we need to, to, we're going to lower, actually lower the cutter out of the way, is that correct? Right. And okay. to do that, there's a gray knob located at the side. Mm -hmm. okay. We simply depress that knob in and okay. rotate it, and it turns down the Ah, knob. so we're not going to cut? No. Okay. I know we have one more important thing we do that our sewing advisor tells us, is that correct? Yes. And this is the step that we have not needed up until now, on every other technique that we've been sewing, we haven't needed this last step on the sewing advisor, advisor that says that we need to have our cutter cover on. Okay, so there actually are two different 
cutter covers. There's cover one, which is on your Husky Lock for most sewing, which is actually a cover for the cutter. And how do we get that off? Just pull, pull it off. right off. Pull it toward you. And then we have another one that we simply... And this is cutter cover two. And yeah. you know that by the little Roman numerals on the corner of them. Okay, and that just slips into place. There we go. And you will be amazed. Snap that up for them, Nina K, and they're going to see that that actually makes this look like a, a flatbed sewing machine, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, we actually can sew right down the middle uh, of our fabric. Well, I know that our sewing advisor tells us one more very important thing. Am I right? Yes. And what is that? And that is to, we're going to bring our little converter down. It says chain stitch lever, lever down. down. Okay. And to do that, we actually turn this little lever, point it out to them so that they can see it. Uh, we actually turn it to the down position. And I will give you my little hint. If you turn the hand wheel as you turn it, it actually turns, just slowly turn the hand wheel as you turn it. It does turn very easily. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't notice when you did it, that disengaged the upper looper. The mm -hmm. upper looper now is not going to move at all. It's going to be in a down position. Obviously, if the upper looper were moving, it would hit that cover. Okay. So that took us through all the steps of the sewing advisor. And I would say that we're ready to sew our two-thread chain by itself. Maybe I could show a couple little uh, things here. This is a beautiful example of some variegated decorative thread done with the two-thread chain, first on a piece of flat fabric, and then actually stitched into a little jewelry bag. So we have a little bag here that you could put things in made from some pretty chain stitch decorative sewing, which is really nice. So let's sew a row for everyone, and we'll sew it right down the middle of the fabric, because this is about the only time you can ever do that on a serger. Husky Lock 5 thread model 1001L does the chain stitch and the 5 thread sewing. And isn't that amazing? We sewed right down the middle of the fabric, and that's the right side. And on the other side, of course, you see the little chains, and that's why we, that's the side we use decoratively, isn't it? Yes. We'd actually be sewing on the wrong side. This is also often used for fitting, because it can be removed when you loosen that chain. The next portion of your Husky Lock Owner's Handbook and video talk about the accessory feet that are available. And Nina K has taken the time to thread our Husky Lock to four thread overcasts. So whichever model you own, thread for four thread overcast. Just follow those steps on the sewing advisor. And Nina K, I noticed that you've got some lovely piping on your jacket, both in the princess lines and also around the edge. Tell me something, did you do that with the Husky Lock? Of course, Sue. I, I knew you did, of course. And, um, what I would like to share with everyone is a favorite foot of mine, and that is the Husky Lock piping foot. And basically, this little foot will snap on. And what I would like you to especially see is the underside of the foot, because that has an actual groove or trench in it. And the piping just lays right in that groove and tracks just whatever straight direction you're sewing. So if you would like to put that on, I will share that uh, you can use this piping foot either to make your own piping, or what I usually use it for is to insert it into the seam of a garment or along the edge, just as Nina K has done. Now we do suggest that you start your piping first, a little piece of piping, and you may sometimes even want to trim off the edge of that piping. Is that right, Nina K? That's what I've done. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And so as you're sewing, you've lined up the piping cord in the groove of the foot. Is that correct? Yes. And that way it will just guide it right in place. Boy, is that a fast technique. And it doesn't let you get off track. It's great. So just sew straight as can be, and it won't allow you to sew crooked or crooked. Oh, it's wonderful. 
Okay, so I'm sure you'll all want to have a piping foot for your husky lock. And then the second foot we're going to talk about is the shearing foot. Now, I, while Nina K is putting this one on, I have a little sample to show you, but let me share first that it's kind of a strange looking foot, really. Uh, it has a little groove that you actually slide the flat piece of fabric in, and then the fabric to be gathered goes down against the feed teeth, and we're going to make a special adjustment to make that fabric gather. So let me share with you the sample that shows the gathering. And in essence, uh, it has a little ruffle. It's a tablecloth that had actually a double ruffle and finished with our rolled edge technique that we showed earlier on the tape. And then actually shirred and attached all in one step quickly and easily with our shirring foot. Are you ready for us, Nina Kay? Let's go. Now, I know we have to make some adjustments to make this work, to make it gather. And so what we're going to do, basically, is lengthen our stitch length to about five, OK? And we're going to set our differential feed to two. And that's what makes that under fabric gather. Can you show them a little bit on the foot the way you have put the fabric in? Because that's so important. You've actually laid the longer piece down against the feed teeth, right side up. Mm -hmm. And then you've laid the top piece, which it's being the ruffle's being attached to, right side down, and that's laying in that little groove on the foot, right? Okay. And so the under one's going to just sure right onto the upper one. This is like magic. It goes so fast. And you can trim a little bit to clean up those edges. And let's take a look at that sample. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a time saver when you're doing curtains or when you're doing pillow ruffles or anything like that, even skirts and things, if you just cut big strips and attach them? That's great, Nina Kay. OK, and then the final foot that we would like to share with you today is actually our pearl and sequin foot. And there are several different applications for it in your handbook. But I do know we need to take out that right needle if we're using big pearls because in this case, we don't want to be hitting the pearls with the right needle. So this will be done with three thread sewing, and we'll be sewing along an edge. Or you may choose to do this with a flat lock stitch down a fold. Today, we're going to use three thread sewing, so 90K is simply removing a needle and snipping a thread. And I'm going to give you a look at the foot. It actually has a little trough or groove in it. And in essence, what you do with that trough or groove is you lay the pearls in the groove. And then at the back of the foot, they go underneath. There's a little guide. So you can see that that allows those pearls to feed along. You're going to be amazed how easy, if you do any skating costumes or any of that type of work. So Nina Kay, maybe you could share that with us. And I have one sample. This not only works for pearls, it also works for sequins. And I have a little a shirt that our blouse that I made for dress a number of years ago that I did this technique with our sequin and pearl foot. I actually laid the sequins into the groove. You can see them right along the neck edge here. And uh, they were tracked over by the stitch and applied to finish the edge. And you can't even see the stitches because they fall right down between the sequins. And the same thing kind of happens with the pearls. They fall right down in between the pearls. So are you ready for us? Almost. Almost. Now, I know you need to get those pearls laid in place, right? Just lay it underneath the little trough and now underneath the one in the back and now lay it underneath the one in the front. OK. so it's. We can see those pearls laying right in that groove. And you, you, you're really smart here to have an extra length hanging out in the back. That's real important. Uh, sometimes I, like with the piping, I start the pearls first. Mm -hmm. OK, so we lower our presser foot. And something else that, that I've also done, I've uh, with my, uh, made my stitch width to the widest position. Because okay. you'll notice when you try to put on the presser foot, it will not fit on if it's in um, five millimeters or six millimeters. So it needs to be out to that seven millimeter stitch width. Also, you may want to bring your stitch length up to about four millimeters, depending on the size of pearls you're using. For mm -hmm. example, I'm using four millimeter pearls, so it makes sense to use four millimeter stitch length. Good. And then I suppose we went back to normal differential <laughs> feet. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> we didn't want to gather there. Good. And what I also do, I lower my presser foot and then kind of what I say, kind of engage my pearls, and I kind of 
hand crank a couple of stitches to just kind of get them engaged. And now we start serging. Okay, and that is going to just stitch right. Boy, is this easy or is this easy? And run this right along the edge. Or as we mentioned earlier, we could use the flat lock stitch and actually run this along a fold. I love this. And these, of course, are the string pearls that are sewn in a sequence. And that's uh, the ones that are easy to put on. And then I found, of course, when you have invisible thread, or you match the thread to your background fabric, you won't even see the stitch. Boy, will that make costume work and decorative sewing and evening garments a snap, won't it? Yes. Well, Nina Kay, we've actually reached the end of our handbook. And I know everyone, I hope, feels that they know a little bit better how to use their Husky Lock. It's been fun, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Well, thank you so much for helping us today and for all your energy and sewing here at the Husky Lock. And thanks to all of you, too. And I will share that we hope that you will visit your local Viking dealer for books and classes and many creative ideas about surging on your new Husky Lock. And for continued ideas and new projects, do watch our public broadcasting program, Art of Sewing. And then until next time, happy sewing. Thank you.